Hi, I'm Jan Witkowski from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and this is the fifth and final day of the 82nd Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, and this year, the, the topic is uh, chromatin segregation structure. Um, and I'm delighted to have uh, Kerry Bloom here from the University of North Carolina. And the, there's a particular the good reason for having Kerry here, because you'll notice that the title of the of the symposium series is Quantitative Symposia. And Kerry's uh, talk at the symposium was called Building the Centromere Spring, which was quantitative and biophysical. So Kerry, explain the Centromere Spring, or building and hunting the Centromere Spring. Um. So maybe I'll just start briefly with a perspective from the chromosome. So I think the chromosome in the public domain right now is the sequence. And of course, uh, there's much more in the chromosome than the DNA sequence. And so I think, you know, looking forward, that's going to be the challenge for us uh, moving forward. How, how, is, uh, uh, how do you store information? How do you propagate information beyond just the sequence of mm -hmm. nucleic acids? So we've known for, y so we've watched chromosomes move, not we, um, uh, scientists have watched chromosomes move for hundreds of years and they, 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 it's a ballet. They do this beautiful movement back and forth, dancing, literally dancing around each other until they finally all line up, and I use that word loosely, um, and then go to, the, to what will be daughter cells. The, the way, the accuracy that they must achieve to segregate all 46 chromosomes in our body roughly 10 trillion times for all the cells in our body is um, beyond anything that's ever been man-made mm -hmm. to achieve that accuracy. And the, to get to your explicit question, they achieve that accuracy by building a spring between the two, what's the microtubule attachment sites and when that, so they don't count chromosomes, for instance. You could have imagined a mechanism where they're counting is one lined up, is two lined up, is mm -hmm. 45 lined up. When 46 is lined up, let's go. They don't do that. They build a little spring between the two microtubules from the opposite spindle poles. And when, those, when that spring is under some tension, uh, it quenches a checkpoint, the checkpoint which is responsible for delaying the next phase of the cell cycle mm -hmm. when chromosomes segregate. So there, if one chromosome is left behind, right, it's still left behind, i.e. not under tension, uh, that suffice to um, delay the cell cycle. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in how that, chromosome, how that chromosome spring works. That region of the chromosome is called the centromere. DNA is a very, as we know, there's you know, six feet of DNA in one cell, and how do you take this very floppy molecule and build a molecular spring? And that's basically what was our challenge. What are the physical components in, in the cell of the, of the spring? And what, what proteins are involved? So... Are they all known? Many of them are known. I would say there's just a few key proteins. They're called SMCs for Structural Maintenance of Chromosome Proteins. Um, Oddly enough, <laughs> uh, 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 they uh, comprise the cohesin proteins that hold sister chromatins together, condensin proteins that, um, and these proteins are all ring-like proteins. Mm -hmm. Those, it's really um, as simple as protein rings and the DNA. And so I think what you're getting at is actually it's the DNA that's the major physical component itself and how we organize that DNA into loops that makes the spring. Mm -hmm. So your, your approach is, is, for want of a better word, a, a sort of a biophysical approach. But don't you need to have a lot of knowledge about the, 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 the molecules involved and their properties before you can start doing a modeling a biophysical approach? Uh, you would think so. <laughs> um, I, so If one is thinking of molecular dynamics and modeling protein structures and proteins docking or, for instance, on the, in the pharmaceutical world of uh, drugs docking into protein binding sites, 
you have to have a lot of knowledge of uh, the atomic structure of a protein. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would hasten to say that, you know, so let's go through the chromosome very quickly. DNA, 1953. Mm -hmm. um, the nucleosome, 1976, something like that. Beyond the nucleosome, there has been remarkably little progress on understanding higher order chromosome organization. And I think uh, that reflects the fact that um, despite our molecular understanding of, of the proteins, as you mentioned, we haven't really incorporated the, the, uh, the, the physical properties of the DNA as a polymer, okay? So a Nobel laureate, uh, Pierre Dujan, pioneered this in the, um, uh, around the 50s or 60s. If you look at a PubMed of his work, it sort of dribbles, 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 dribbles along, and then it's rocketed, mm. because now um, the biologists have realized we can learn a lot with very little incorporation of the proteins, actually remarkably little incorporation of the proteins, into the polymer kinds of models that Dijon um, pioneered. Mm. Um, and these models have no, uh, there's no atoms, there's no molecules in these models. These are very simple bead spring models because we're trying to model in the human three times 10 to the nine haploid, three times 10 to the nine base pairs. If we start putting atoms in there, there's no computer yes, yes, right. in the world that'll come close. So, so tell me about your approach. How, how, where, how, what did you start with? And um, I started with, um, so after I read this, uh, I oh, mentioned that I, I, I meant for this, this particular work you're doing now. W w w when you're doing your modeling, what, what, what parameters, what, how do you set about building a, what is it, a theoretical spring? Yeah. Uh, so uh, sort of the workflow type of thing. Mm. The workflow was in a room with uh, computer scientists uh, applied mathematicians and physicists, we would meet once a week and the meetings would go for two or three hours. I was shocked that all these people would sit there for two or three hours and do this. And I would start drawing the, uh, so it started on a chalk, a, a chalkboard <laughs> where I would start drawing the position of the DNA um, within this, so, so it starts with, so I'm an experimental biologist, and it started with being able to visualize the centromere DNA in live cells. And so, um, and so basically what that entails is looking at fluorescent spots relative to the spindle microtubules and watching them jiggle around mm -hmm. in real time. Right. Uh, then we started literally uh, drawing how we imagine the DNA might uh, exist within this structure that would be compatible with the motion that we see in the microscope. Mm -hmm. And from those drawings, uh, we started uh, literally writing down equations. What's the force balance, right? What's, um, what are the key, I mean, I think the key in this is, is it's a very reductionist perspective. So there's way more complexity than we're building in our models, but we're trying to sort of capture the um, gestalt of the, of the system mm -hmm. uh, in as few parameters as possible to uh, coarse grain. Uh, so it really started with the math people and the physicists and myself drawing structures and trying to understand, uh, you know, does the DNA go like this? Does the DNA make loops? And then what do I know from the biology that's actually accurate? And what can the physicists tell me about whether this makes physical sense or not? Because you, you were showing some really quite detailed models and. Uh, I'm distinguishing, you distinguish in your talk between what are uh, drawing models yes, what are draw as opposed to ones with dynamics that have yep. been built from, from yep. molecular dynamics. But you, you were showing really some quite detailed um, models. And I still don't quite get how you go from this very, what you've already said is, is a very uh, reductionist, a few parameters as yeah. possible, to what look like yeah, very detailed, very detailed models. Model. Um, so here's what we do. So we, um, in the model, there is basically, um, there, there, it's called a bead spring model. Mm -hmm. So there's these bead springs, uh, and there's thousands and thousands of these bead springs. 
And the, the model has physical um, parameters. So the model, uh, for instance, in yeast, there's the nucleus has a certain size. We model it as a sphere. And the, the DNA, uh, uh, so when I say DNA, it's actually these, these bead spring chains. Mm -hmm. the, I would say what the landscape that has changed in the past probably decade is the computer graphics that now go with the models. So now what we can do is we can add in the models, a bead looks like this. And then mm -hmm. the computer graphics allows us to basically uh, seamlessly go from the mathematical model into a computer-based model that mimics the behavior okay. of these beads. All right. right. So in a way you're substituting. So you, you've We're got you've got a mathematical <coughs> model, and that can be that can be uh, could be sort of turned into a diagram. But then you you add you then sort of add the components that exactly. cell biologist knows about. And, and exactly. Analysis. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, right. Um, I, but coming back to that point about molecular models and uh, models and and something that's that has some basis in I don't know reality I suppose it's not right but in the the, the 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 picture is based on molecular dynamics where you actually try to take account of the of what the molecules are up to um, that can be that can be quite a dangerous thing the in the sense that the first type of model can be taken as being a true representation yes, right, of, what, yep. of what's going on. Yep. Um, where it didn't really. I mean, it's... It, there is not a single solution <laughs> to, uh, it, uh, in our model. There's, there's not a single geometric solution in our model. I would say that um, because I'm steeped in experiments, what the... So, I, so we do computer graphics, and that's what you saw there. You saw the computer graphics of this model. We then take that model, and again, this is because of the rapid rise in computer science. We can take that model, and I can put fluorophores in that model and simulate what mm. those fluorophores look like in the microscope. Mm. Okay? So I have a direct comparison of what that model um, predicts yeah. uh, relative to what I see in the microscope. So right now um, we have, like I mentioned, we have condensin in the model, cohesin in the model. Um, um, they're, not, uh, they're not the molecules of condensin and cohesin. What they are are these, their bead spring, their, their bead spring circles that have the dimension of, of cohesin and condensin oh. respectively. That's what they are. So I let them wiggle around. Uh, d due to Brownian dynamics, and then I ask, after they reach some equilibrium, what do they, what would, what does the model predict they would look like? And, and the answer is we tweak the model until the model matches the experiment. Okay. So that leads me on to my next point, I think, that uh, so you're tweaking your model so that it behaves in a way that fits what you see experimentally. So is, doesn't that mean that all you've done is you've, you've given another description, another sort of description of the experimental Absolutely. observations? Absolutely, yep. So, of course, what I'm getting at is, does your model now tell you things, lead you to expect things that you would not have thought of otherwise? Right, exactly. So we started with... Um, long floppy DNA chain and how do you build a centromere spring. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the centromere spring is what's is a bottle brush. So you mm -hmm. know the bottle brushes mm -hmm. that we clean mm -hmm. test tubes with? Mm -hmm. that, that's the centromere spring. So you have an axis right. and there's a bunch of little hair brushes. Okay, so what we never would have, um, and I also, I talk a lot about using the model to build intuition, which we can go into, but so what the spring is, is there's a central axis, right. and now I have a bunch of hairs. These are all bead, these are all bead springs. Um, if I take a piece of uh, DNA, again, bead spring, uh, and let it wiggle around, it's going to wiggle, 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 and make a random chain, right? right? And it's yeah. going to have some radius, and some radius is defined by some mathematical equation. If I take that same bead spring and now put these hairs on it that are, all, that are also bead springs, when it bends up, mm. the hairs interfere with, interfere each, with each other. Right. When it bends down, right. the hairs interfere with each other. And of course, this is in 3D. And so that bottle brush builds stiffness. So that's what 
that's the centromere spring. It's a bottle brush spring that's stiff, throwing the two centromeres, this, right, these are the right. regions that attach to microtubules, oh, uh, they're predisposed to be on the opposite sides of each other before you even right. get to a microtubule. Right. So that intuition we would not have um, considered. And in the cell, what are these what are these loopies? Is it the, the DNA? They're the DNA or? loops, a la Joe Gall lamp yeah. brush chromosomes and Oscar Hertwig, yeah. 19, uh, sorry, 1890s lamp brush chromosomes. That's what they are. Mm. So I think what's exciting to me is, so I mentioned, you know, why have we not made uh, considerable progress past the nucleosome? There's not an ordered structure. People were, yeah, yeah. were you know, yeah, yeah. would live to prove or disprove the 30 nanometer fiber. There's not, it's not an ordered structure. It's because um, you might ask, why do we care about, I think these springs exist all throughout the chromosome, right? And the springs are a consequence of the density of these loops. Mm -hmm. So you can stiffen the, uh, uh, the chromatin fiber. You can weaken the chromatin fiber. We used to talk about, we still, we teach heterochromatin and euchromatin, right? Literally dark and light chromatin. Mm -hmm. And I think the conversation will turn to regions of high loop density, regions of low loop density, stiff regions of the chromosome, weak floppy regions of the chromosome oh. to allow various me DNA mechanics to occur. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about how you, how you started, um, started this, this project. And you mentioned that you were, in a, you were going in a room with mathematicians and physicists and so on. Um, so two points about that is, first of all, how did they regard regard you and how did you find their understanding and willingness to uh, to appreciate biology let's start with the f yeah let's start with the second one actually about what was it like dealing with mathematicians and physicists with a very sloppy science like biology um well i'll start with this statement uh genes in their mind are Carrie's little secrets. <laughs> so I shielded them from the complexity of all the genes that are mm. contributed to a process. Sure. Because that yeah. would short circuit yeah. um, right. the yeah. conversation. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that this is why physicists don't become biologists. They're very <laughs> uncomfortable with the, um, and it was Minot that said, right, nature's a little dirty, right? Um, uh, they're very uncomfortable with the, with the complexity and the uncertainty that mm. we are very comfortable with. Uh, I would say we both actually just had to um, get over, um, we left our egos at the door <laughs> and we got over our inhibitions of what we don't like. And I would say that's how they dealt with it. They, um, because they would come up with all the time with, well, the strands must do this. They're, how do they, how do they, why don't they collide with each other? Well, there's topoisomerase. Let's not talk about <laughs> topoisomerase, yes. right? Yes. Well, it's that classic thing that, um, uh, you know, Mac, uh, when Jim and Francis came at the double helix, Max Delbruck, of course, the physicist, yep. um, was very worried about how could they, how could the, the replicated strands and why, not yeah. and why, yeah, yeah. how could they separate, how could they separate? So they separate. could make catamers or whatever. Yep. And uh, Francis said, well, the cell does it. That's, that's you know, <laughs> there's something that does it. We won't worry about that problem. <laughs> that is, that's the strategy is the same. Right. So, uh, so on the, then on the other side, which I think is actually more interesting, is is about biologists um, thinking in these mathematical, biophysical terms about about their work. And I've always felt the biologists have have had an envy almost of mathematicians and physicists and as soon as, a bio as soon as a biologist sees a nice equation in a, in a paper they think oh this, this must be really good yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and how can, how can one get, uh, get biologists out of that, uh, that sort of mindset do you think? I mean you've done it. Um, um, I think uh, well I think how you get them out of the mindset is you show them that there's a lot to be learned actually mm, I think mm. that's the case and I think I mean I the uh, uh, a positive aspect of the, well, so Cold Spring Harbor was prescient in quantitative biology mm -hmm. for now the 82nd year, yeah, but, yeah. but obviously all the colleges across the nation are now 
you know, quantitative biology this, quantitative biology that. They're, they're finally figuring out that we need to get there. Yeah. Although, of course, quantitation in, in, in the symposium title derives from the biophysics in the 1920s. And, uh, and, by, and biophysics, by and large, has not been very successful outside um, Hodgkin Huxley right, equation. Right, now. right. And I think you mentioned earlier about sort of membranes have been right, popular. Right, very popular, thing. yeah. Um, I think it's going to be difficult, though. I think. Um, uh, you, you said biology is, I mean, biology has always been quantitative, but quantitative is not, is not simply doing terabytes of sequencing. No, that's right, right, that's and right. And I think that's, I think too often at the moment, that's what quantitative biology is thought to be, just produce tons of data. It's not quantitative in the sense that, that you're using it in the, in the sense that you, the work that, that you do. Right. So I would say that the computer graphics is what's going to span that gap. Mm. Because now we don't just have to look at the equations. The equations can actually be under the rug, and the biologists can look at the outcome mm. um, it, uh, graphically right. and use, so in my mind, pictures are, are what are, are bridge the gap. Yeah. So the, because the other thing I think that's, that um, was very inhibitory was the language problem. We just, um, I did not know that, uh, what are the two words, uh, stress and, I forget the other word right now, but um, uh, it's the, yeah, I forget right now. Uh, no, not, st uh, stress and strain. Um, stress and strain have very different mm -hmm. mathematical definitions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in conversation, I'm under strain, I'm under stress, yes, right? Yes, they, they're yes. almost interchangeable. Yeah. So it was the language barrier that was huge that we had to be very, um, this is what I mean by leaving the egos at the door. We had to be, we really had to dive into what do you mean by this word or what do you mean by this equation? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we were patient with each other. Yes, yes, it, the problem is it took years to get past that, right? It took years till we could really um, talk with each other. You know, and just like you say physicists, you mentioned biophysics has been, you know, people, it's just, I mean, all these disciplines are as complex as biology, right? People, I'm a biologist, I could walk out and not recognize anything with a green leaf from any <laughs> other thing with a green <laughs> leaf, yes, right? Yeah, I don't, you yeah. know, so it's the same thing with physicists. I think um, uh, it, it's not physics in general, right? So I'm working with polymer physicists, yes. right? I didn't know yeah, that was a field, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so our view of these other disciplines is, is as naive as, naive as, as, as theirs is of <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, I think we should stop there. Let's, okay. let's hope this naivety goes away in the yes, coming years. Yes, let's hope so. Yep. Thanks very much, Kerry.